Okay, so we're going to talk about cat adrenal disease if for no other reason because I can. And I want you to go back and diagnose some cat adrenal disease when you leave here, especially um, when, if you were here when we were talking about insulin resistance. You know, I challenge some of the folks to go back and diagnose acromegaly in a cat in the next few months. I want you to go back and diagnose hyperaldosteronism in a cat in the next couple of months because I guarantee that you're missing them just because uh, for the reasons that we're going to talk about in terms of the signalment. Uh, so again, that's me. That's where the notes are. So we're going to first talk about uh, we're going to talk about Cushing's in cats, then Addison's in cats, uh, and then lastly we'll talk about hyperaldosteronism in cats. So Cushing's in cats is you know has been for a long time felt to be fairly uh, rare disease. Um, we have a paper coming out shortly uh, on uh, using trilostane to treat uh, Cushing's in about 30 cats um, that um, we worked on with the people from Penn. I think it probably, it's certainly way less common in the cat than it is in the dog. It's probably much more like the disease in humans than the disease in the dog because cats with Cushing's, one, it's less common, and B, it's almost always associated with a very large pituitary mass. Um, most of the time when we see Cushing's in cats, it's because we backed into the diagnosis, either because it was a profoundly insulin-resistant diabetic cat or because it had cutaneous lesions, uh, cutaneous dermal atrophy and tearing of the skin. And there's very few things in cats that'll do that. Cushing's will do it. Uh, pancreatic carcinomas will do it. Other abdominal carcinomas will do it. Um, but Cushing's is certainly something that we look at. When we look at the age distribution of cats with Cushing's, they, they do tend to be older cats. And for whatever reason, uh, we don't see this in dogs, but... 78% uh, of the cases that have been reported, and then in our case series that we just did, same thing, 75-plus uh, uh, plus percent of the cats are female. The clinical signs, it, it's hard to tell because a lot of the clinical signs of the Cushing, Cushinoid cat often mirror the Cushinoid diabetic cat, so the PUPD polyphagia may just be reflection of diabetes mellitus. Um, they often have relatively significant insulin resistance. Um, currently, our award-winning cat is a cat who is on uh, 25 units of Glargine three times a day. Um, you know, and eventually, at some point, somebody said, well, that just seems like too much insulin. Um, and then we worked the cat up for resistance. And they're, on their physical exam, they can look like Cushinoid dogs. So they can get a nice pot-bellied appearance, hepatomegaly, uh, muscle wasting, uh, alopecia. Um, again, but the thing that's kind of more typical of your basic Cushinoid cat is the severe dermal atrophy, ulcerations, poor wound healing. Uh, it seems to be way more common uh, in the cat than it is in the dog. Um, oh, these pictures don't really turn out that great, but this was a cat that had a skin wound, a laceration that had been repaired four times and was just never healing. Um, this was also a concurrently diabetic cat. Um, and so this area had been shaved for the first uh, repair, and that was about six months ago, and the cat had simply never regrown his hair. Uh, none of the wounds ever healed up, even though they were treated appropriately surgically. The cat had insulin resistant diabetes and also had a very large uh, pituitary tumor. The worst one I ever saw, and I don't have a picture of it, but the worst one I ever saw was a cat um, came into the exam room for insulin uh, resistant diabetes, a poster child of Cushing's, bilaterally symmetrical alopecia, belly rubbing on the ground, thin skin. I mean, it, I was basically crying. I was so excited that this cat had blessed him, blessed me with his presence. And the cat was on the exam table, and I was talking to the owner, and the uh, intern was in the room, you know, paying attention to the cat. And the cat decided, yeah, it had enough of this whole thing, and it was going to leave. So it went to jump off the exam table, and the intern just reached out to kind of scruff the cat to keep him from going. Yeah, it didn't work. So the cat went forward, left the table, hit the ground, and the intern had the back of the cat in his hand. It was phenomenal. So he's standing there, and he's about ready to faint. The owner, the cat's fine. The, the cat's like on the ground looking around going, what in the hell? You know, it's very cold in here. And the owner's looking at me like, and I knew that I was screwed. Like, I wasn't going to get any more diagnostics out of this cat, and I wasn't going to get to work it up. You know, we just kind of put the fur back on the cat and said, you know, <laughs> We're going to have to figure this out. From a, a laboratory perspective, again, most of these are concurrently Cushinoid, so uh, they're almost all hyperglycemic, uh, hypercholesterolemic, um, high alphos in about 30% of the cats. Remember that cats don't have a steroid-inducible isoenzyme like dogs do. So 
cats with Cushing's and cats on steroids are not going to develop a high alkaline phosphatase. So the high alk phos in these cats probably uh, reflects hepatic lipidosis secondary to uh, the concurrent diabetes. Cats also, because they're much more resilient about the effects of glucocorticoids, they often do not develop uh, a stress leukogram. Um, so in dogs, we almost always expect a uh, lymphopenia, eosinopenia. Really don't see that in cats on steroids. And also cats uh, with Cushing's and diabetes tend to have urine-specific gravities that are still greater than 1020, although admittedly, since they can concentrate to infinity, um, a urine specific gravity of 1025 may be decreased concentrating ability or is decreased concentrating ability for a cat. And we should go ahead and routinely culture uh, urines from cats who are diabetic and you think might be cushionoid because they, they will have a very high incidence uh, of urinary tract infections. Again, because their urine's diluted, they concentrating ability is one of the means by which you kill bacteria. And both of those diseases uh, are immunosuppressive diseases. Similar to the case in dogs, we have lots of tests that we can do, which means that no one test is 100% good in cats. And so we can do some form of a stimulation test, some form of a dexamethasone suppression test. Really don't do much urine-based testing in cats just because it's a pain. Um, and the urine-based testing in dogs is largely based on owner obtaining urine, which for a cat owner is going to be hard. And then there are uh, protocols doing what's called a combination test or a V-test, which is a DEX suppression test immediately followed on the same day by an ACTH stimulation test. And I think part of the issue with CATS and what test is the best test or which of the tests um, are superior is that we just don't have papers looking at hundreds of CATS with Cushing's. <clears throat> now, when we do ACTH stem tests in CATS and we're using Cortricin, we used to use a half of a vial, but now we are using the low dose 5 microgram per kilogram uh, IV. Um, you can also do that uh, IM. Again, the nice thing is with these low dose protocols is that you can freeze the remainder of the cortricin in plastic syringes, uh, and then it's good for a year. And in cats, we're looking at with cortricin doing a pre and a 60 minute post. Uh, so the same thing with the dog. If you're using compounded gel formulations of ACTH, you're going to want to do a pre, a 30, and a 60-minute post uh, because some cats with the gel product actually peak faster. And so it may be that you actually miss the, the highest uh, cortisol level. Um, so with the gels, you're going to want to do a pre, 30, and a 60. With DEX suppression testing, again, because cats are, you know, the walking adrenal medullas with hair, highly um, developed in terms of their sympathetic axis, in terms of the whole uh, flight or fright thing. Uh, what we quickly figured out is that while a 0.01 mgs per kg of dexamethasone given intravenously to a dog will consistently suppress cortisol levels for up to 24 hours, it does not happen in cats. And so different studies have looked at different dosages uh, of dexamethasone in cats. And in cats, the DEX suppression test is actually 0.1 mgs per kg intravenously with a pre of 4 and an 8. So a cat low-dose DEX is 10 times the dose of a dog low-dose DEX. Uh, and that's just because of inconsistent suppression. We have the same issue in cats as we do in dogs, is that non-adrenal illness can affect the pituitary adrenal axis to the point where you're going to get false positive tests. And this is true of both the ACTH stim and the low-dose DEX. And obviously, diabetes is a significant concurrent illness. So when we look in the dog who is a concurrent diabetic, the data says you should do an ACTH stim test. In the cat, it looks like that we want to do, uh, still do a DEX suppression test in the cat because the ACTH stim test in the cat seems to be more affected by uh, non-adrenal illness. Urine cortisol to creatinine ratio, again, just, uh, just hard because the problem is if you're getting it in the hospital setting, then you've got a cat who gets put in a carrier, driven to the vet hospital, taken to the vet, taken into the back, has cystocentesis and has urine removed and the UCCR is high. So, and because of the lack of sensitivity or lack of specificity, it's probably something if you want to do it, you can rule it out because a normal UCCR in a cat effectively rules out Cushing's. But an elevated UCCR in a cat means that we probably need 
uh, to go back and do an ACTH stem uh, or a low-dose dex suppression test. Now, there is a test that they do primarily at Michigan State that's on their panel, which is this combination test. And so what it is is a dexamethasone suppression test, uh, 0.1 mg per kg IV. You do a pre, a two, and a four-hour sample, and then you immediately give ACTH and take a one- or a two-hour pose, depending on what ACTH you're using. Now, the theory is, is that what you're trying to do is to combine uh, two different tests to not only diagnose hyperadrenocorticism, but if you saw suppression during the dexamethasone part and then a hyper response to ACTH, then basically you could diagnose PDH all in the same day. The problem is it, it doesn't work. Um, and so what it looks like is that this test is no different over doing the dex suppression part by itself or the ACTH stimulation test part by itself. Combining them probably isn't helpful and the main reason is probably because we don't go to eight hours. You know, if you had gone to eight hours on the deck suppression component and then did an ACTH stem test, you might be able to do what uh, the test was designed to do, but then it becomes a nine or a 10 hour test. And so that's not very practical. So not too many people use this test. I would just do a straight up uh, low dose dex or a straight up ACTH stem. We have the same issue in cats as in dogs. It's about 80%, 85% PDH, remainder adrenal tumors. You can try and differentiate PDH from adrenal tumors by doing a high dose dex, but I would discourage you from doing that. I think that that's probably uh, not the way to go, um, just because if they didn't suppress on the low, they're probably not gonna suppress on the high. Uh, what we primarily do to differentiate is to measure ACTH levels in the blood or do some kind of imaging, either ultrasound, CT, or MRI. Now we talked about the other day, how many people were here to talk about dog Cushing's? Oh good, just a few. And you'll have to listen to this again because it's interesting. <laughs> For those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, one of the issues with looking at imaging is that you always need to correlate imaging data with hormone data. And whenever the two don't agree with each other, always go with hormone data. Uh, the reason being are these things called pituitary incidentalomas um, or adrenal incidentalomas. And this is the percent of patients that have a pituitary tumor or adrenal tumor that has nothing to do with why they're there today. So for instance, if we took you guys and did an MRI of your pituitary, uh, what we would find is that 12% of you would have a pituitary mass. Uh, so 12% of you have a pituitary tumor. It's not going to grow, it's not going to be secretory, it's probably never going to hurt you, it's just going to sit there and do nothing. But the problem is that someone's working you up for something and finds that you have a pituitary tumor, it creates an issue. And there's all these books and chapters written on what to do with the person that has an incidentally discovered pituitary mass. The problem for us is that in cats, we don't know the percentage of old cats that have pituitary masses that aren't doing anything or the percentage of cats that we're working up for Cushing's who in fact are acromegalic and have a pituitary mass from acromegaly, not a pituitary mass related to Cushing's. So when we're looking at the imaging data, we always have to try and correlate a hormone finding like what's the ACTH level in association with what we're seeing on imaging. Same thing with adrenals. 8% of you guys have an adrenal tumor. Uh, it's benign, not functional, will never do anything. Again, we don't know the incidence of cats, how many cats are running around with adrenal tumors. We know in dogs it's not uncommon. But again, if you find an adrenal mass in a cat and you're working them up for Cushing's, you want to do something from a hormonal standpoint to document that that tumor is actually secreting cortisol. Because that could be a non-functional tumor that you found by accident, or it could be a pheochromocytoma. Um, it could be something that's completely unrelated. We also see in cats lymphoma of the adrenal, um, other tumors and infectious diseases that get screened out by the adrenal. So adrenal megaly or an adrenal mass doesn't necessarily mean uh, adrenal tumor. So probably looking at uh, ultrasound to look at the adrenals, are they unilaterally enlarged or bilaterally enlarged? Again, the whole issue of incidental lymphoma is these silent lesions. One thing to remember is that cats uh, have adrenal calcification pretty normally especially in older cats. And adrenal mineralization in people and in dogs is a sign of malignancy, but in cats it's a sign of normalcy. Uh, and that's because there's so much fat in the cat adrenal gland that occasionally it undergoes ectopic uh, calcification. 
This is unfortunately what we see in most of our cats with pituitary dependent Cushing's, uh, and that's that most of the cats with PDH have fairly large tumors uh, in the pituitary. Same thing with acromegalic cats tend to have fairly large tumors in their pituitary. This is a cat, uh, this is Chairman Meow. Uh, we saw another cat <laughs> earlier. Uh, Chairman Meow lived, lives still uh, in Los Angeles where the cat is just an absolute hellion. Um, we couldn't touch the cat. Uh, the owner was finding that we couldn't touch the cat. For the first two weeks after surgery, when we took the tumor out, it was the world's nicest cat. I mean, it was head budding, it was jumping in your lap. I mean, it was just like phenomenal. Uh, day 15, it reverted back to evil. Um, and so unfortunately, we don't love him anymore. But, um, but most of these cats end up having really big tumors. The way that we like to differentiate pituitary from adrenaline cats, again, is just to measure ACTH. Uh, the one thing about that in cats is that some cats have endogenous ACTH levels that are below the reference range, normal cats. And we don't think that that's normal. We think that some cats secrete a different isoform of ACTH. So the value of ACTH testing in cats is that if it's normal or high, it's pituitary. If it comes back low, you're probably going to have to ultrasound the cat. Uh, because I can't tell you for sure if that's a normal finding or if that's a cat that actually has a functional <coughs> adrenal tumor. Uh, whatever lab you're using, Antec, Idex, other labs can supply you with special tubes because um, you need a special tube to collect the sample in. Uh, you spin it down, take the plasma off with a plastic pipette, put it in a plastic vial, and then send it to the lab and it's quite stable. It's actually stable for up to a week. Uh, at uh, refrigeration. So this is a nice way. This probably differentiates uh, more than 95% of the cats. So because the disease is not very common, oftentimes we end up doing multiple tests uh, to make sure that we have more than one thing telling us it's Cushing's. Um, we may do more than one type of uh, imaging modality, whether it's ultrasound, CT, or MRI, because what we know is that the treatment and the prognosis of cats so far, it looks like the treatment's more challenging and the prognosis maybe not as good as dogs, but I think part of that is we just don't uh, have it treated enough to be sure. Functional adrenal tumors, uh, in one study of 41 cases, 24% uh, of the cats had hyperadrenocorticism as a result of adrenal tumors. Like in dogs, equal adenoma versus carcinoma. Certainly, if it's a surgical candidate, surgery is probably the way to go from the standpoint of curing the cat of the tumor and getting the fastest remission of the Cushing's. What was shown initially was that surgery was not very good in cats if they weren't pre-treated. So you want to treat the cats medically first, get the hypercortisolism under control, and then if the owner is willing to do surgery, go in and take it out. Because what we found was because of the effects of steroids on wound healing in cats is that cats had a very high rate of dehiscence a lot of uh, infections uh, post-surgery if they weren't pre-treated first. And the long-term prognosis for cats with adrenal tumors is unfortunately not, not, it's not clear. Um, what ends up happening is that we see a fair number of cats where the tumor removed is an adenoma, only then do we find out six months later that it wasn't an adenoma, it was a carcinoma, and then we see metastasis. And we've had cats with very malignant appearing tumors on histopath uh, never have the tumor recur. So I think prognosis is tough. Ideally, if it's the left adrenal or if it's the right adrenal and there's not cable invasion, I would probably recommend to the owner that they pre-treat with trialistain, uh, get the signs under control, and then take the cat to surgery uh, and get it removed. <clears throat> These are just some slides. This is a nice adrenal mass uh, in a cat with Cushing's, a well-encapsulated mass. Um, this is a necrotic center. A lot of times these tumors outgrow their blood supply, and so you'll see areas of necrosis uh, and mineralization. This was a cat that the, the histopath came back as an adenocarcinoma, um, but this cat did uh, well for more than two years. Now, from a medical standpoint, we have similar drugs to what are used uh, in dogs. Uh, lysodrin, uh, metiroponin, adrenal enzyme blocker, and ketoconazole, another enzyme blocker, trilostain, an enzyme blocker and then selegiline, which is the monoamine oxidase inhibitor. I, I think that the data pretty much shows that ketoconazole is not effective uh, for whatever reason in the cats. While ketoconazole is a potent blocker of adrenal steroid synthesis in dogs, it is not in the cat. And so while there have been some isolated case reports showing 
some improvement in clinical signs on ketoconazole. Their ACTH stem tests still look bad. So I would say that uh, it's probably not a good choice. Uh, doesn't block cortisol production. And there are side effects in terms of hepatotoxicity uh, and thrombocytopenia. So probably I would, I would skip that one. Uh, Metiripone is a very good blocker of cortisol production in the domestic short hair cat. The problem with metiripone is that it is twice a day to three times a day. Its duration of action is very long. You have to monitor them with ACTH stem tests to, to see where you are. It does not cause electrolyte abnormalities, so we don't usually have to look for that. But the issue with metiripone is that the longer they take it, both cats and humans, the less efficacious it becomes over time. And we think that what happens is that as you lower the cortisol levels with the metiripone, you're raising ACTH levels, which cause further adrenal hyperplasia. And eventually, the amount of hyperplasia is so severe that the adrenal enzyme blocker uh, doesn't work. The other thing with metiripone that's annoying is that it's the worst tasting substance on the face of the planet. And it comes in a capsule that literally is like feet thick. It's a big old capsule. Um, so you have to basically get it compounded, and we haven't found anything that masks the flavor of metiripone. I actually tasted it one time. It, it is god-awful. Um, so I would make sure that if you're going to use it in a cat, that it gets down their throat before it hits their taste bud. Lysodrin is the drug that we used to use most commonly before we started using trilostane. Same dosing, same protocol as in dogs. I think it works fine in cats. It's just that it's going to have the same... Uh, incidence of side effects and potential side effects as it does in dogs in terms of GI upset uh, and the uh, possibility of inducing Addison's disease. So um, there are several case reports looking at lysodrin in cats, but I think most of the data now uh, looks like that probably trilostane is going to be a better choice for cats. Selegiline, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, uh, we've had no data to support efficacy in cats. We think it's probably because the pathogenesis of pituitary-dependent Cushing's in cats doesn't have anything to do with dopamine. So probably cats get Cushing's because they get a primary pituitary tumor, not because they have a dopamine uh, deficiency that results in hyperplasia, which then results in a tumor. Um, but it hasn't been used in some cats to try and treat Cushing's in acromegaly, uh, but with really not very much success. So the drug I would use is trilostane or veteral. Uh, we start all cats at about two to three mg per kg once a day. Uh, in the study that we just did on about 30 cats with Cushing's, uh, we only had to do BID dosing in two cats. So it seems like in cats, SID dosing works better than it did uh, in the dog. And we want their pre and post cortisols on the trilostane uh, to be less than six micrograms per deciliter, which is lower than the dog recommendation. So it looks like to get uh, control of the signs of the Cushing's in the cats, uh, we're going to have to push them a little bit harder uh, than we push the dog. Usually, too, what this means is that your basic cat's going to be on a 10 milligram uh, tablet of veteral. And if you have to go lower than that, um, and you're going to have to use compounded uh, trilostane, just remember that there's a lot of variation in trilostane from compounding pharmacies in terms of how many milligrams are actually there. So you may not see as good of control because one month he may be getting four milligrams, one month he may be getting 15 milligrams. Um, so if you can try and dose them to a size that fits the federal uh, commercial available product, that would be great. And for most cats, that'll fall in that 10 milligram size. Surgery people have done, uh, there's one study doing bilateral adrenalectomy as a way to treat PDH. Um, that's sometimes done in humans where the pituitary tumor can't be removed and they're not responding to adrenal enzyme inhibitors. They'll do a bilateral adrenalectomy, which certainly gets rid of the hypercortisolism. The problem with bilateral adrenalectomies in people is that it can predispose to something called Nelson syndrome. And that is when you take out both the adrenals and your cortisols are low, you get really high ACTH levels, which actually cause growth of the pituitary tumor. So the pituitary tumor can actually get much larger, much faster, uh, following adrenalectomy. And so a lot of the human patients that undergo bilateral adrenalectomy also undergo prophylactic pituitary irradiation uh, to prevent that from happening. What happened in the cats that underwent bilateral adrenalectomy was nothing good. Uh, three of the nine died within two months, all of infection. Uh, median survival was only five months. And again, 
If for whatever reason you're at the point where you're thinking about pulling out the adrenals, uh, the first thing I would tell you is you probably are genetically wired differently. Um, maybe you like surgery and that's your answer to everything. Um, if you're going to do a bilateral adrenalectomy, I would tell you treat them with trilostane first. Uh, make them fail that first or at least try to control their hypercortisolism uh, before you go in and remove uh, both the cat adrenals. Uh, with Chairman Meow, we actually went in and removed his tumor surgically, and like I said, he became a nice cat. Um, he's still alive. He's probably about two years out now from uh, his diagnosis. And that's a very deceptive photo, because um, <laughs> that is not him. Uh, Addison's disease in the cat is also kind of a strange thing, because with Addison's disease in cats, it's also felt to be relatively uncommon but I think that stems from two things. One is we don't stem a lot of cats because we just don't think about it. And the other is that we're probably missing a segment of cats that are glucocorticoid deficient only. Um, and so because they don't have electrode abnormalities, we don't think to do an ACTH stem test. So it largely can go unsuspected. We don't really know the incidence of isolated glucocorticoid insufficiency. And it tends to occur in middle-aged cats, which is typical of uh, canine Addison's. Male versus female being equal is unusual in the dog because it's mainly a female disease in the dog. And it's been reported most commonly in mixed breed cats and not so commonly in purebred cats, but again, I think it just reflects uh, the number of cases that are being reported overall. This is the biggest problem with diagnosing Addison's in a cat. These are the most common clinical signs. They're lethargic, they don't want to eat, they puke every once in a while, they're losing weight. It's every single cat that comes into a veterinary hospital. So basically all cats are Addisonian. Um, the main thing though that gets you to think about Addison's a little bit more strongly is that these are cats where the symptoms wax and wane. So they're good for a few days and they feel bad for a few days and they're good for a month and they're sick again. Keeps going back and forth. Especially cats that are doing this back and forth thing and when that happens, they're getting azotemic. And if you have cats with uh, recurrent bouts of azotemia that respond really well to fluid therapy, that's very unusual for chronic renal disease in the cat, but that's very consistent with Addison's. So if you have a cat that has a really good response to uh, IV or sub-Q fluids, or somebody gives the cat a little dose of steroid because you know, they don't know exactly sure what's wrong with that, it's okay to give them a little steroid, and the cat feels fantastic after that and then starts to feel poorly again, those are cats where I'd want to bring them back and do uh, an ACTH stimulation test on them. On physical exam, pretty nondescript stuff. Um, if they're in a full-blown Addisonian crisis, um, then certainly you can see hypothermia, shock, uh, hypotension, um, and hyperkalemia and, and arrhythmias. Most of the time what we're seeing though is just a really sick, flat out, uh, dehydrated cat. And the duration of symptoms is median is 14 days. And this actually should be 100. Uh, the range goes from five to 100 days. And these are the cats that are just doing the up and down, up and down, and then eventually they come in uh, flat out um, because they come in in an Addisonian crisis. If we look at their laboratory abnormalities, very similar to dogs, uh, hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Uh, sodium potassium ratio is less than 24. This can also, though, be seen in cats with third spacing, so cats with pleural effusion, cats with peritoneal effusion, especially chylothorax or chyloabdomen, <coughs> can result in sodium potassium ratios like that. And then where we tend to get led astray is the presence of azotemia because these cats are sick, they're azotemic, they have dilute urine, so then they get diagnosed with renal failure. And again, the thing that would make you think, well, maybe it's not renal failure, is when you come in the next day, after putting the cat on IV fluids, the azotemia is resolved. So again, rapidly resolving azotemia in a dog or a cat, uh, one of the things we should always think about is, is, is it Addisonian? 25% of dogs develop hypercalcemia with Addison's. Seems to be very rare in the cat. There's only been one case report of a cat that was hypercalcemic. Not sure that that cat was hypercalcemic from Addison's because it may be that that cat had idiopathic uh, hypercalcemia from GI absorption. And that cat was treated with steroids, which is the treatment for that disorder anyway. So it may be the hypercalcemia resolved simply from the prednisone uh, and not from treating the Addison's. Same thing, stem test, cortricin, IV, IM, 
uh, pre and a 60 minute post. And what we should see is zero and zero. And, you know, most of these cats, they have no uh, amount of cortisol at rest and, and zero amount of cortisol post stimulation. Treatment options for mineral corticoid replacement. Acutely, we do DOCP because they're sick and they're not going to take oral meds. Chronically, you can use either one, uh, Florinef or DOCP. The nice thing about DOCP, it's better at controlling the electrolytes than Florinef is. The other nice thing about DOCP is that if you're giving it or the owner's giving it, then we know that they're always getting their mineral corticoid. Otherwise, with Florinef, they have to take it twice a day forever, uh, which can be an issue. The other difference between these is that Florinef has uh, glucocorticoid-like properties. Uh, so many cats and many dogs who are on Florinef don't need to take a supplemental glucocorticoid, but they do need to take a supplemental glucocorticoid during times of stress. So if the cat gets sick for any reason, we supplement them with steroid. If the cat's going to have an elective anesthetic procedure, we supplement them with exogenous steroids for uh, one or two days before and one or two days after. DOCP has no glucocorticoid-like activity, so cats on DOCP uh, need to take a supplemental steroid uh, in order to get rid of the signs of glucocorticoid insufficiency. And typically that means we're going to give them one and a quarter to two and a half milligrams per day of prednisone, or we're going to give them 10 milligrams once a month of methylprednisolone acetate. If at all possible, I'd probably try and do uh, daily pred only because it allows us better to titrate the dose. And I think as the methylprednisolone tapers off, the cats tend not to feel that well. And mainly what happens with too little glucocorticoid replacement is that they have GI signs. Their appetites fall off, they get some vomiting, they get a little bit of diarrhea, they lose some weight. Now the main uh, effects of the steroid are going to be on the GI symptoms. Now the disease that I want you to go home and diagnose is hyperaldosteronism. So... Uh, hyperaldosteronism, the incidence in cats, uh, I think is unknown, but what we're seeing is that the incidence going up because um, every few months somebody's publishing studies on hyperaldosteronism in cats. So we are getting an increased awareness of the disease. Um, typically, these are geriatric cats, and it may be a component of multiple endocrine neoplasia. So these are cats that have already been diagnosed with one endocrine tumor. So they were diagnosed with hyperthyroidism, and now they're being diagnosed with hyperaldosteronism. Or they're diagnosed with Cushing's, and now they're being diagnosed with hyperaldosteronism. Um, so it can be a, a genetic defect that involves multiple endocrine tissue. And the classic clinical signs of a cat with hyperaldosteronism are weakness, lethargy, anorexia, and when their potassiums get really low, they develop uh, cervical ventral flexion of the neck. And there's really only two things that we know about that'll do that in a cat. One is hypokalemia, and the other is thiamine deficiency. So if we have a cat with cervical ventral flexion, certainly we're going to want to measure his electrolytes right away. Um, but that's one of the hallmarks of this disease, is that as the potassium gets low and nerve conduction drops off and the polarity of the nerve and muscle junction goes away, um, that muscle weakness is going to be profound. Physical exam is usually boring, because uh, you're not going to really see anything or feel anything on physical it's mainly in the laboratory area where we pick up or think about hyperaldosteronism or where we forget about it. And that is most of these cats are going to be hypokalemic. It can be quite severe uh, with potassium is less than two and a half. The thing I think that confuses people is that the sodiums are usually normal. And I think that, you know, with Addison's and hypoaldosteronism, you know, we can make sense of hyperkalemia and hyponatremia. And so we would expect with hyperaldosteronism that they would be hypokalemic and they'd be hypernatremic because of the sodium retention. But what happens is the kidney is really smart. And so with the hyperaldosteronism and you're getting sodium retention, it's going to pull free water. So as long as the cats are drinking, you're going to see uh, the vast majority of these patients have a normal sodium concentration. If they quit drinking, then certainly we'll see their sodiums go up. The other thing that can be seen, and this is sort of the triumvirate of symptoms, is that they're hypokalemic, they have a high CK, and they're very hypertensive. And the reason they have a high CK is because of the hypokalemia causing muscle necrosis. And hypertension is very common uh, with hyperaldosteronism because of the effects of aldosterone on uh, arterial vasoconstriction and on uh, blood volume. 
How high will that CPK be? How what? How high will that CPK be? Oh, it can be in the 10 to 20,000. Yeah, I mean, it can be screaming high. And some of these cats with severe hypokalemia and really high elevations in CK, it hurts. They're very painful when you palpate their muscle groups. So when we're looking at hyperaldosteronism and all the things that can go wrong, um, this is kind of a good spot just to review what, what is happening here with the renin-angiotensin system. So what happens is that it kind of starts with your kidneys secreting renin in response to decreased renal perfusion. So in response to decreased renal blood flow or hypertension, <coughs> the kidney secretes renin. Angiotensinogen, which comes from the liver, undergoes an enzymatic reaction uh, with renin to become angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1, as far as we know, doesn't really do anything. Angiotensin 1, though, is it flows through the capillaries in the lung, undergoes an enzymatic reaction with ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, which converts it into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 does lots of things. So angiotensin 2 increases sympathetic tone, which will raise heart rate and blood pressure. It'll cause increased tubular resorption of sodium and chloride and potassium and water, or potassium excretion. There'll be secondary water retention because your kidney, as it resorbs the sodium, wants to pull water with it. Angiotensin 2 will go down and stimulate the release of aldosterone uh, from the adrenal, which then will go up and further enhance tubular sodium resorption. It also causes very potent arterial vasoconstriction to raise blood pressure, goes to the brain, stimulates the release of antidiuretic hormone, which causes increased water retention as well. So the net effect is water and salt retention. Uh, your circulating blood volume increases, and as a result of that, perfusion of the juxtaglomerular apparatus increases, which shuts off further production of renin. What happens in these cats is that the whole system gets messed up because there ends up basically being two uh, primary causes of hyperaldosteronism in cats. One is due to what's called in people as Kahn syndrome, which is a unilateral adenoma or adenocarcinoma of the adrenal gland. Rarely in people you can see a primary form of hyperaldosteronism that is due to bilateral uh, adrenal hyperplasia, and it can be dramatic. The hyperplastic adrenal glands actually look nodular on uh, ultrasound and on histology. And these patients are characterized by really high aldosterone levels with low to normal renin activity. And this is important because when you're looking at aldosterone, it depends on what is a high aldosterone associated with high renin or high aldosterone associated with low or normal renin. Uh, this disease con syndrome, adrenal uh, tumors resulting in this uh, syndrome of hyperaldosteronism, obviously was discovered by uh, Dr. Kahn. Um, the trivia fact of the day that you probably don't want to know is that my dad was diagnosed with uh, Kahn syndrome and an adrenal tumor uh, when he was uh, 32, and his doctor was Dr. Kahn, so I actually met the guy. I don't remember it at the time, but now I do, and now I worship him because he carved this thing out of my dad, and he, my dad's still alive 50 years later. But he was one of the first patients in his case series on hyperaldosteronism, and they couldn't figure out why my dad was so hypertensive um, and so weak and um, having muscle problems and, and stuff. It was quite bizarre. Um, so with, with secondary hyperaldosteronism, what happens is that your renin levels are normal to high, and this is anything that causes decreased renal blood flow, hypotension, decreased perfusion of the kidneys, so <clears throat> congestive heart failure, renal disease, GI disease, liver disease. And so this is associated with elevated aldosterone because renin is motivating the system to get you to secrete aldosterone. What both of these things lead to is increased potassium excretion in the urine, uh, lowering total body uh, potassium. Remember that when you're hypokalemic on a blood panel, your total body potassium is insanely depleted because your body's going to try and maintain plasma potassium. And so if your plasma potassium can't be maintained, you've already moved all the potassium outside of your cells. Um, that's a, a severe uh, total body depletion. Increased sodium absorption leading to higher circulatory volume because of the increased water resorption. Increased renal tubular bicarb transport and hydrogen ion loss in the urine, which results in a metabolic alkalosis. And in cats, we can see profound muscle weakness, and in cats, retinal detachment, uh, secondary to uh, hypertension. And sometimes that's the first symptom. 
of the disease in a cat is a cat who comes in acutely blind with uh, retinal detachment. Now, the way that we can diagnose this is first from a hormonal standpoint, and we send these to Michigan State, is by measuring aldosterone level, and typically these things are insanely high. So their aldosterone levels are commonly greater than 2,500, uh, where up to 400 is considered to be normal. What we don't have in the U.S. is a, uh, a consistently reliable way to measure renin. Renin is very hard to measure in all species. You really don't measure renin. You're measuring renin activity. Um, so right now what we have to do is just rely on aldosterone and then look at some kind of imaging modality to confirm the presence of uh, an adrenal mass. So the presence of hypertension, hypokalemia, muscle weakness, high CK, high aldosterone in an adrenal mass is what you're going to use uh, to diagnose uh, the primary form of hyperaldosteronism. These are just some cats with primary hyperaldosteronism. On, this was an ultrasound image. The cat had a 1 by 7 by 2 centimeter mass. That's the vena cava under there. This is another cat with a nice plump uh, adrenal that we saw at surgery. Uh, this is another cat on uh, ultrasound that had a very bilobe, very, very enlarged, a 1.4 by 3 centimeter uh, adrenal mass as well. And this same cat underwent CT. Uh, this is the cat's right kidney here. This is the cat's right adrenal gland, uh, slightly big. Uh, that's the cat's vena cava. This is what makes the surgeons very nervous. Um, so whenever we're considering adrenalectomy in cats or dogs, especially if it's right-sided, uh, we're going to go ahead and CT them. Uh, we're looking not so much as the cava being compressed, because they're usually being compressed, but what we're looking for is their turbulent blood flow, a filling void, a defect, a thrombus, or something that's within the cava. Because uh, if it's already invaded through the frontal abdominal vein and grown into the caudal vena cava, uh, those are much harder surgeries uh, to deal with. Um, and you can go in, you can do a venotomy, remove the tumor, remove the thrombus, sew the cava back together. Uh, it makes surgeons very cranky uh, to do that sort of thing. So they like to have as much imaging data as possible. So the treatment of choice for a cat with a unilateral adenoma or carcinoma, and there's no evidence of metastasis, would be to go ahead and take the cat to surgery and do an adrenalectomy. You get rapid resolution of the hyperaldosteronism, rapid res uh, resolution of the hypokalemia and hypertension. However, in cats that are not felt to be good surgical candidates, we can manage them for quite a while uh, medically, uh, when usually what we're doing is oral potassium supplementation in conjunction with spironolactone, uh, which is an, anti an aldosterone antagonist, and also a potassium sparing diuretic. And then if, that's, uh, if, if we are also treating concurrent hypertension, then we'll usually put them on uh, a calcium channel blocker like amlodipine. So they'll be on amlodipine, potassium supplement, and spironolactone. And we've had cats live with that uh, for more than two years without surgery. The problem is, is that in not getting rid of the hyperaldosterone, what we're setting them up for is uh, renal failure. And that was brought out by a study that was published uh, in 2005, describing a second variation of hyperaldosteronism in cats. So these were cats who have what was called primary non-tumorous hyperaldosteronism. So they had all of the same clinical signs as the cats with an adrenal tumor, but on ultrasound, no evidence of, of tumor on ultrasound. They would have mild adrenal megaly, uh, perhaps. They had a higher incidence of renal disease. They were hypertensive, hypokalemic very high aldosterone levels, very suppressed renin, which argues that it's a primary event, not secondary to something else. What they also discovered in these cats was that in this form, that the, the biggest problem with these particular cats is that chronic hyperaldosteronism without primary treatment resulted in progressive renal sclerosis. And it resulted in the formation of uh, fibrous tissue in the kidney, thrombus formation within the small vessels within the kidney, and systemic arterial hypertension with proliferative changes leading to more rapid progression of coexisting renal failure or the occurrence of renal failure in these cats. So what they initially described, and we've seen this as well, are 11 cats that presented with hypokalemia, uh, muscle weakness, uh, retinal detachment, Three of these cats had a normal BUN and creatinine at admission, but later uh, progressed to azotemia. 
Eight of the cats were azotemic at first examination. In these cats, as they treated them medically for their disease, and as the cats uh, died off, they found that adrenal hyperplasia was present on three of the cats. And when they did histopath of four of the cats at necropsy, they all had severe glomerular sclerosis. And one of the uh, concerns with hyperaldosteronism is that hyperaldosteronism leads to remodeling, vascular remodeling, not only of the heart, uh, which is one of the contributors behind uh, heart failure, but also to remodeling and sclerosis and intrarenal hypertension in the cat. And it looks like the tumor is formed, the unilateral adrenal tumor form, leads to more complete suppression of renin and less kidney damage than the cats with this idiopathic bilateral disease uh, where they have incomplete suppression of renin, which together with hyperaldosteronism leads to progression of renal disease. And so the, the reason why we bring these up is that I think that what you should probably want to do is, again, when you go back and you start looking and seeing cats that come in with uh, azotemia, hypokalemia, and hypertension, is don't just assume it's renal disease or primary renal disease. I'd probably start measuring aldosterone levels in those cats and see if how many of the cats have aldosterone levels that are high, image the cats, and even if the owner's not interested in uh, treating the cat primarily with surgery to treat it, one of the things that we're looking at doing is treating these cats with spironolactone as an aldosterone receptor antagonist. And the reason that we're looking at that is this was a paper that was published a few years ago in humans, but in patients uh, who had primary hyperaldosteronism where they did not undergo surgical treatment, the group that was treated with spironolactone lived significantly longer than the group that did not take spironolactone. And so I think that in these cats that have the primary non-tumorous form of the disease, it's very important to probably get those cats on spironolactone um, to not only help control the blood pressure and control the potassium, but basically to block the effects of hyperaldosteronism. That's the guy, that's Dr. Khan, the guy who carved the tumor out of my dad. Um, also, you probably participated in the 50th anniversary of the discovery of aldosterone. Um, you were, I don't remember seeing any of you at the party. Uh, it was a grand time uh, as well. And aldosterone has been linked to all kinds of evil. There's a lot of evidence now that uh, humans and you know, dogs and cats with congestive heart failure should probably take spironolactone, not as a diuretic, um, but as a protective effect against uh, further sclerosis uh, of the heart and of the kidney. All right, does anybody have any questions? Yes. So should we be putting uh, chronic kidney cancer in <laughs> Well, I think that, you know, that begs that question. Um, and then we've had this conversation with renal people, and I think that the, the answer to that question, the real answer is we don't know. Uh, the, my guess answer is probably yes, um, especially if, they, and certainly if they have aldosterone levels that are elevated. Um, you know, I would be very much inclined, spironolactone is very safe, um, I think it's a reasonable thing to consider doing in cats that are hypertensive, hypokalemic, have renal disease, and their uh, aldosterones are elevated. I would just put them on it and see. Um, but I think that that's something that people are actively looking at. There's enough cats now being found that have elevated aldosterone that someone could probably do a prospective study and look at survival. And I think what you're probably looking at is a study very similar in cats to like looking at a calcitriol placebo effect or an ACE inhibitor placebo effect in cats with chronic renal disease. I don't know why we couldn't do a spironolactone placebo in cats with chronic renal disease. Yeah. How low is the potassium? Is it, is it <coughs> down or two or lower? Um, it'll be low in virtually 97% or so of cats. It gets profoundly low below two and a half in about 10% of cats. Okay, and if you treat the cat with potassium supplements, do you expect the cat to respond yeah. to that? Should feel much better. Okay. Yeah, I mean the cat will feel way better. Um, I mean they need emergency IV potassium in that setting, um, but once you control their potassiums with IV supplementation and start them on oral, you can usually regulate their potassium by giving them oral potassium supplements and spironolactone, and control their blood pressure with amlodipine. If spironolactone by itself isn't going to control it, which most of the time I think doesn't. I think they need to be on a calcium channel blocker. Can they have this in the absence of high blood pressure? Uh, by definition, no. So by definition, you have to be hypertensive and hypokemic and have elevated aldosterone to fulfill this. Yeah. 
But I think that what's happened in the past is that we found a lot of renal failure cats with hypokinemia and hypertension just attributed it all to kidney disease. Yeah. Yeah. How do you follow up on your Cushing's cats that you put on trilisthenia? I used to take stem tests, four hours when post. When do you start? Yeah. Two weeks out? When do we follow them? So just like with dogs, so we'll start them and see them seven to ten days, see them in a month, and then see them every three to four months. Yeah. Same protocol, still check their electrolytes just like we do. In dogs, we didn't really see much in the way of uh, electrolyte abnormalities, but I think that's because that adrenal cascade that I showed the other day for the pathways—that's dog and human. Not sure it's the same in cats, so we don't know if the same enzymes are in place and at what level the enzymes are in the cat. Um, so we didn't really see much in the way of electrolyte changes in cats, but for now, we tell people you should monitor it so we know that it doesn't do it. Or until some cat goes permanently out of something. <laughs> then I'll say, see, I told you. You should have monitored it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>